Since Ruben Mamoulian's Becky Sharp of 1935, the first film in Technicolor, the cinema has had the power to change the color of everything, including the paintings of Henri Matisse. However faithfully you try to reproduce a color, the problem remains. Have you reproduced the true one? When the artist allows himself to be guided by his feelings, the color appears immediately, wrote Goethe, and of course he was right. Every one of us has an individual sense of color, just as every moment and every place has its own tone and its own light. Anyone who says they do not recognize the true colors of Matisse in this film should know that our reference point is the color control chart. Sometimes you have to be satisfied with the average. Matisse gave color absolute freedom to control all the other components of his painting. This framed color hanging on the wall in his interior with aubergines could almost be described as the ultimate Matisse. Painted in 1910, the large interior with aubergines predicts what Matisse's painting has in store for us for the rest of his working life. Interiors, the studio, the home become magic places where the transformation of the real into the work of art is carried out. A floral motif invades the whole picture. Traditional perspective is disrupted. A real flower placed in a vase on the mantelpiece, a calming presence. The flower reappears as a printed motif on the ochre-colored cloth attached to a decorative screen. Patterns, flowers, cloth, canvas. The legacy of the weavers is everywhere in Matisse's art. Matisse was from Picardy, the north of France, an area noted for its spinners and its weavers. Cloths and fabrics reappear constantly in his paintings. Flower patterns and bold colors are part of his birthright. The mirror, reflecting a strange checkered cloth, perhaps a reversal of the curtain over the door. Patterns everywhere in dizzy profusion. The cloth covered screen provides a decorative background that crowds the still life. A vase, a statuette, a dish of pears arranged on a three dimensional tablecloth echoing the mood of quiet luxury. The eponymous aubergines occupy a different kind of space. Surrounded by an expanse of textiles, they appear tiny, so one's gaze is drawn to them. Through the window, so often in Matisse's work, a punning metaphor for the painted canvas, a landscape. In Interior with Aubergines, Matisse introduces us to his favorite mood. It is decorative, luxurious, somehow oriental. The ordinary bourgeois world is being observed with extraordinary thoughtfulness. Matisse. I do not paint things, but the relationship between them. Matisse's life is recorded in black and white. He was born on the last day of the year in 1869 in Cato, Picardy. His parents were shopkeepers. His father wanted the boy to enter the legal profession. In 1888, Matisse became a solicitor's clerk. In 1890, while bedridden with appendicitis, he was given a box of paints by his mother. I felt gloriously free, he later remembered of his first efforts. Quiet and alone. 
His father was a grain merchant, his mother, Marchand de Couleur, an ironmonger. Business and pleasure, sense and sensibility, order and adventure. Matisse is a uniter of contradictions. One half of him is a luxurious materialist, the other a pensive poet. One of his ambitions is to portray the real world, another is to paint the spirit. These photos have been lent by his son, Pierre Matisse. They're in black and white. It always comes as a surprise to be reminded that Matisse was a 19th century painter, 11 years older than Picasso, the same generation as Toulouse-Lautrec and Signac. In photographs, Matisse is almost always at work, how different from the fun-loving Picasso. A broad, sturdy man. But Matisse's heaviness has an opposite too, a restless spirit, an appetite for travel. Matisse. I am as invisible in my work as the filmmaker who films the different aspects of an unknown landscape from the front of a locomotive. Matisse's travels are always the inspiration for changes in his work. Matisse. If I had been younger, I would have had no hesitation in settling there. To the journalist, Dorothy Dudley. The New York light is exceptionally beautiful. And then these skyscrapers, these masses that rise into the air in a light which is like crystal. The New York atmosphere is so dry, so crystalline, like no other. The skyscrapers, he said, are eaten up by the light. To the painter, André Masson. When you see America, you will understand that one day they will have painters, because in a country which offers such a dazzling visual spectacle, it's impossible that one day there won't be painters. Frank Stella. The idea of color and uh, the idea of the freedom of Matisse, you know, seemed to be a kind of freedom that seemed natural and open, something more, something, you know, more sympathetic to the kind of American drive, whatever it might be, to make more expansive or larger, more open paintings. In some ways, Pollock, but I wouldn't argue this theory, but certainly painters like uh, Rothko and Newman were, would be unthinkable without Matisse. And I think unthinkable without Matisse from the Museum of Modern Art, in, in my humble opinion. Another thing that made Matisse so available and so accessible uh, is, I think, a painter that people don't think so much about now, but was a very, very powerful image in New York, uh, all during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and that was Hans Hoffmann. And in every way, Hoffmann seemed to be an extension of Matisse. Hans Hoffmann, Mark Rothko, Barnett Newman, Frank Stella, perhaps even Jackson Pollock, they saw the great Matisse paintings gathered in the New York Museum of Modern Art during the 30s. They admired them and were inspired by them. <coughs> Matisse. We achieve serenity through the simplification of ideas. The whole is our only ideal. Details detract from the purity of the lines. The dance from 1909, a simple pleasure and a difficult self-appointed task, how to transfer a swirling movement to the fixed canvas. Matisse to Gaston Deal. When I had to compose a dance for Moscow, I simply went to the Moulin de la Galette on a Sunday afternoon, and I watched the dancing, particularly the farandole.
La Danse is an enlarged detail from a picture that we are not allowed to reproduce in colour, La Joie de Vivre, painted in 1906 and now locked away in the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. When I started to paint, I felt transported into a kind of paradise, wrote Matisse, remembering his first paint box. La Joie de Vivre is his image of that paradise. The New York picture is a sketch for a painting commissioned from Matisse by one of his first clients, Sergei Stukin, a millionaire businessman from pre-revolutionary Russia. On the walls of the former residence of the Grubetskoy princes, Sergei Stukin assembled a remarkable collection of great modern French painting, Gauguin, Cézanne, Picasso, and above all, Matisse. Matisse to his friend, the critic, Thériad. Stukin, an oriental cloth importer, was about 50. He was a vegetarian and extremely sober. One day he came to the Quai Saint-Michel to see my paintings. He noticed a still life. I'll buy it, but first I need to take it home for a few days and if I can stand it, and if it still interests me, I'll keep it. I was lucky that he didn't weary of my still life. He came back and commissioned a series of big paintings to decorate his palace in Moscow. After that, he asked me to do two decorations for the staircase of his palace and that was when I painted La Musique and La Danse. After the revolution, Stukin's paintings were requisitioned by the Soviet museums. The New York version of La Danse was donated by Nelson Rockefeller, Matisse, court painter to Russian and American capitalists. In the 30s and 40s, Matisse and Picasso were to influence a whole generation of American painters. But long before that, the two great innovators were watched and admired by the artists of the Russian Revolution, Tatlin, Malevich, Rodchenko. It was the icon-like simplicity and serenity of Matisse's paintings that appealed to the Russian purists. There were also strong family resemblances between the oriental images discovered by Matisse on a visit to Tangiers in 1910 and the Russian folk art rediscovered by the Soviet avant-garde. The mystery of the Orient pulled Matisse around the world, from North Africa to Constantinople. The art of the icon painters gave him courage. He said, you surrender yourself that much better when you see your efforts confirmed by such an ancient tradition. His portrait of Madame Matisse is an icon. The Museum of Modern Art in New York. I feel through colour, and so it is by colour that my canvas will always be organised. The Red Studio, 1911. The busy patterns of the interior with aubergines have been replaced by an all-embracing, all-enveloping red. The red takes the place of the furniture, the floor, the ceiling and the walls, the shadow and the outline. It takes the place of perspective. It is the picture's chief source of light. It is the light itself. Everything has been flooded in the colour, even time itself, the clock has lost its hands. Only the artist's other paintings survive intact. Like Velasquez, Matisse was a painter of paintings. But he did not become a true colorist, he said, 
until he had learned to use black. When I didn't know what color to put down, I put down black. Black is a force. Only the frame of the French windows tells us that what we are looking into is the darkness of space. This is perhaps the closest Matisse ever came to being an abstract painter. Between 1917 and 1930, Matisse kept up his restless exploratory travels. The critic, Dominique Fourcade. Matisse's eye seems to move like a camera, which was still a novelty in those days. It begins a long pan from canvas to canvas, going from a close-up to a shot that slowly draws back or vice versa, giving part of the scene, then the whole scene, varying the angles from which it is shot. Each different shot is the subject of a separate canvas. If you assembled them all together, you would have obtained the complete cinematography of his pictorial universe. In Nice, Matisse spent the Roaring Twenties, resting and relaxing. From 1921 onwards, he spent half of every year in the south of France. He was not the only one. At the end of the Twenties, Jean Vigo and Boris Kaufmann shot the film A Propos de Nice at their own expense. Louise Chevalier sings the praises of a relaxed life. It's understandable. The world is trying to forget the massacre of 1914-1918. In Notes of a Painter of 1908, Matisse had announced a program for his work that seems extraordinarily inert. What I dream of is an art of balance, of purity and serenity devoid of troubling or disturbing subject matter. An art which will serve anyone who works with their brain, the businessman as well as the man of letters. A soothing, calming influence, a mental balm, something like a good armchair in which one rests from physical fatigue. The camera of Vigo and Kaufmann gives one portrait of Nice. Matisse, in this scene of extras from the Victorine Theatre waiting to be hired, provides another. The easy images disguise complicated feelings. Dominique Fourcad. He is a troubled artist and his painting is troubled. He works with a dogged insistence, returns to the same problem time and time again. He plunges into the sealed universe of his paintings and shuts himself away in it. A powerful sense of ennui emanates from the succession of images produced during this curious decade and a half. Matisse paints a world of waiting. Time drags. He becomes a kind of voyeur, observing the gloomy eroticism of the pleasure seekers around him. Everything is far away, as if the painter finds himself on a different wavelength to the rest of the world.
Vases, elegant flowers, strangely lifeless. The bone china women have themselves become still lives. Porcelain figurines, unreal dolls. Paradigm of this disquiet was painted in 1925, decorative figure on an ornamental background. Are we looking at a woman or a straight-backed, smooth-skinned oriental statuette? The clash of multicoloured fabric strikes a garish note, a display of vulgar taste, unique in Matisse's art. In the foreground, four oranges arranged in a green bowl. For many years, Matisse kept this disquieting decorative figure in his own collection. His other odalisks, taking their endless siestas, he sold to rich American collectors. Jean Cocteau. The sun-drenched fauve has become a bonard like little cat. The atmosphere of Bonard, Vuillard and Marquet prevails in the room. The window of a Vuillard room opens into a Marquet sea. One looks for Matisse and one notices, dare I say it, a professional defamation. What is going on? Matisse works without underlying discipline, without the hidden geometry of a Cezanne and the old masters. If you assemble these paintings into a sequence, they do indeed give an impression of disquiet, a premonition almost of another disaster. It happens in 1929, the Great Crash. The origin of the odalisks is to be found at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the School of Angle. Painter in the grand style, conservative, academician, and father of all odalisks. From 1895, Matisse was a student at the École des Beaux-Arts, sometimes under the dreaded conservative Bouguereau, and more productively in four years of study with Gustave Moreau. At the entrance examination to the school, Matisse's marks were as follows. Nought in architecture, four in sculpture, 13 in history, four in perspective, 17 in nude studies.
His fellow students included Monguin, Marquet, Camois and Durin. Matisse was the eldest and his friends called him the doctor. Dry academicism, the art of the plaster cast, was the speciality of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. But in Gustave Moreau, Matisse found a progressive teacher who encouraged his pupils to continue their education, not in the classroom, but at the Louvre. Bougreau to Matisse. You will never be able to draw. Gustave Moreau to Matisse. You will simplify painting. Colours must be thought. Was one of Moreau's favourite sayings. Dreamed, imagined. At the Louvre, Matisse copies the paintings of Philippe de Champagne. In 1898, Moreau dies. Matisse leaves the Beaux-Arts. He marries and makes his first visit to the south of France. On the advice of Pizarro, he honeymoons in London and studies Turner. In 1899, he sells his wife's engagement ring and uses the money to buy from the dealer Voila a Van Gogh drawing, a Rodin plaster, a Gauguin painting, and Cezanne's bathers. Cezanne. I try to convey perspective through colour alone. Matisse. I owe my art to all painters. 1898 to 1905 were the learning years. Matisse, the post-impressionist, the plein air painter. Matisse, the divisionist. The various experiments lead to a radical solution, an explosion of pictorial energy and colour. Ovism overthrew the tyranny of divisionism. Matisse later explained. One can't live in a house too well kept, a house kept by country aunts. One has to go off into the jungle to find simpler ways which won't stifle the spirit. Woman with the hat, a deliberate insult to the conventional portrait, a painting that shocked the bourgeois, pure colour, uninhibited brush strokes. In this display of forbidden sensuality, a woman too has painted her face. Matisse was unrepentant. I have not created a woman, I've painted a picture. Woman with the hat made his reputation. The celebrated Stein family, famous defenders of the avant-garde, Michael, Sarah, Leo and Gertrude, buy his paintings. Picasso and Matisse. For 50 years they watch each other and learn from each other. In Picasso's collection, paintings by Matisse. Picasso to Matisse. I have drawing and I'm searching for colour, whereas you have colour and you're searching for drawing. Picasso. Matisse has the sun in his belly. The relationship between the two giants of modern painting was fiercely competitive. In 1907, Matisse gave Picasso this portrait of his daughter, Marguerite. In 1910, Dauin advised Matisse not to visit Picasso's studio in Montmartre. He warned that certain fanatical cubists were using the portrait of Marguerite as a dartboard. From the National Museum of Modern Art at the Pompidou Centre, another icon, the portrait of Auguste Pellerin. The businessman is depicted as a meditating oriental.
Matisse. I say to my models, imagine a story and follow it through in your mind. Dare I say that what I paint is thus the private cinematography of my model? Running through the thoughts of each of Matisse's sitters, a different film. Most are pleased with the portraits, but not this man, the writer Paul Leoto. In his diary of October 20th, 1947, Leoto records... With a pleasant feeling of good riddance, I have sold my portrait by Matisse. Only 40,000 francs. Never mind, I am still delighted. A portrait, said Matisse, is always troublesome. A different kind of cinematic exploration takes place in this filmed portrait of Matisse. Matisse to the photographer Brassaille. I was very uncomfortable during the showing of this film. A lot of things bothered me. It is most indiscreet to show your private face while you are working. I felt as though I'd been stripped naked in front of the audience. But it was an unforgettable lesson to me. I was shattered by the slow motion. What a strange thing. Suddenly you see the movement of the hand, which is completely instinctive, caught by the camera and broken down. That sequence dismayed me. I kept asking myself, is that you doing that? What the hell can I do right now? I was without a single familiar landmark. I recognized neither my hand nor the painting. I anxiously quizzed myself, is it going to stop? Is it going to continue? What direction will it take? I was astonished to see my hand continue on and on until it reached a full stop. Usually, when I begin a drawing, I have an attack of nerves, if not anguish. But I've never had such a scare as when I saw my poor hand in slow motion setting off into the unknown, as if I was drawing with my eyes closed. Fascinated by the rhythms of the cinema, Matisse has his own works carefully photographed at different moments of possible completion, like stills from a film. Matisse. At each stage I reach a balance, a conclusion. When do you consider a painting finished? When it represents my emotion in a very precise way. To the poet Louis Aragon, Matisse admits, the model is always love at first sight. The canvas is a screen onto which the painter projects his desires in lines and colours.
history of painting, the most significant of the Ten Commandments is the second, which expressly forbids the worship of graven images. It was not until the Council of Nicaea in 787 AD that artists were officially allowed to put a face to God, to the saints, the angels, and the heavens. At the Council of Nicaea, the iconophiles triumphed over the iconoclasts. It was perhaps the most significant event in the history of art. The unimaginable could be imagined. Do I believe in God? asks Matisse in an interview with himself. Yes, I believe in God when I'm working. In 1952, in a letter to the inhabitants of his hometown of Gatto, he elaborated on his beliefs. Steered, I don't know why, towards the path of the Beaux-Arts, coming from a background that had no reason to point me in that direction. It was as if, having had other occupations, I was now called to this one. I hurried to work, compelled by I don't know what, by a force which I perceive today as being something outside my life as an ordinary man. In 1948, Matisse embarked upon his most ambitious project, the decoration of the Chapel of the Rosary at Vence. He was to consider it his masterpiece. The chapel was to be a complete work. Matisse designed the floor-to-ceiling stained glass windows, the murals painted on white ceramic tiles. He designed the vestments, the altar, the spire, he suggested what music should be played, and he even underwrote the chapel's cost. I tell the stories in black and white on the walls. The sun playing on the windows does the rest. Picasso, the convinced atheist, was furious with his friend. Why don't you build a market instead? He shouted. You could paint fruits and vegetables. As far as I am concerned, Matisse replied, this is essentially a work of art. I don't know whether I believe in God or not. But what we are all looking for in art is to rediscover the atmosphere of our first communion. Matisse had created a religious space into which people could come to feel purified, free of their burdens. In 1930, tired of Nice, Matisse set sail for Tahiti in search of just such a peace, just such a space, just such a light. Matisse. One is afraid of a whole day which begins with a brilliant sun and which will not change until sunset. It is as if the light had stood still forever. It is as if life were frozen in a magnificent attitude. By going to Tahiti, Matisse was deliberately following in the footsteps of his hero, Gauguin. On show at the Gauguin Museum in Tahiti, Matisse's only known Tahitian work, a quick sketch painted before the motif, the movement of a rocking chair. Matisse could not work in Tahiti. For three months, he loafs about. Matisse. In Tahiti, one is caught in this atmosphere of doing nothing. Laziness is stronger than anything else. To Bonnar, he wrote, I spent 20 days living on a coral island. Pure light, pure air, pure colour. Diamond, sapphire, emerald, turquoise, fantastic fish. I didn't do a thing except take bad photographs. Among the photographs brought back by Matisse from Tahiti, this portrait of the painter by the German film director Friedrich Murnau. They met by pure chance. Murnau, maker of Nosferatu, was in Tahiti with Robert Flaherty, shooting a strange South Seas epic, Taboo. Beneath the surface of the earthly paradise, all was not what it should be.
landscape and the actors were the familiar South Seas cast, made popular by Gauguin. But the primitive society Moore now portrays is rife with injustice, with prohibitions, punishment, and taboos. Murnau, the convinced Westerner, thinks he has discovered evil in the barbaric rules of the Polynesian primitives. All was lost long before the arrival of the missionaries and the soldiers. Like Gauguin and Matisse, Murnau came to Tahiti in search of paradise and did not find it. For Matisse, the experience of the South Sea Islands was to consolidate a view of the world he had already formed by 1910. Only the painter could create a true paradise. But it was to take 20 years or so for the images of Tahiti to reappear as Matisse's images. The final representations of this endlessly dreamed of golden age. In the bucolic setting of La Joie de Vivre, the dancers are frozen in their movements, weighed down by the burden of humanity, like Tintoretto's angels. An oriental paradise, flowers woven into patterns, cloths covered in signs, the Garden of Eden turned into a prayer mat. Matisse to Aragon. The greatness of an artist is to be measured by the number of new signs he's introduced into the language of art. Each thing has its own sign, the briefest possible indication of the character of the thing, the sign. The last images, light as paper kites. The prototype for these pasted images is perhaps this pair of dancers, tried out in 1937, their cut-out shapes still pinned to the canvas. The slightest breeze would send them fluttering. Drawing with scissors, Matisse called it. Cutting into living colour reminds me of a sculptor carving. The blue nude. Drawing has become colouring. Colouring has become drawing, the ultimate solution. But it was to take many years for Matisse's art to metamorphose into its ultimate form, for the butterfly to hatch from its chrysalis. On his return to France from Tahiti, Matisse illustrates the poems of Stéphane Mallarmé. Memories of the South Seas, precisely presented, local colour and folksy detail.
in Nice, Matisse rents an old film studio and embarks upon a 40-foot-long mural painting, a new version of La Danse. The mural is a commission by Dr. Barnes of Philadelphia. In May 1933, the work is completed and installed. The Barnes Foundation is not a museum, but a school that specializes in the teaching of art through experimental observation. Paintings have become teaching aids. They are grouped in walls of images, according to themes, amid a decor of antique furniture and ironware. Nearly 50 Cezanne, 80 Matisse, 180 Renoirs, Picassos and Manets, Degas and Van Goghs, Tintorettos and Titians. All are locked away behind these walls where few visitors are allowed and cameras are forbidden. Because of an error in the measurements, Matisse had to paint La Danse again. The first version is now in the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. In 1941, Matisse had an operation for cancer of the intestine. Before the operation, I always wanted to do two things at once. After the operation, he is left a semi-invalid confined to bed for many of his waking hours. Yet his art reveals a new enthusiasm and freedom, some of the quickness of the old fauve for a turns, under the influence of oriental calligraphy. His studio come apartment in Simier in the hills above Nice is turned into a domestic paradise full of exotic plants and caged birds. Matisse, the man from Picardy, renews his interest in textiles. Huge lengths of ceremonial cloth brought back from Tahiti surround him, color sewn onto color. Memories of the South Seas continue to haunt him 20 years after his return in the simple pasted shapes of jazz, the stained glass windows of the chapel advance, the huge paper cutouts of his last years. Matisse to Gaston Deal. When I work, it is a kind of perpetual cinema. Jazz, 1947, an extraordinary illustrated text of almost 150 pages. Matisse's journeys flashing past in vivid colour, his visits to the circus as a child, acrobats and clowns, horses and sword swallowers, lights, tinsel. Icarus, the dizzy flight. A final journey, the Pierrot's funeral. The 
cowboys farewell. Magic lagoons, created by the movement of oceans and volcanoes. Jazz, full of vivid, unsullied color, dominated by a butterfly blue. One day in 1898, Matisse remembered, he had spent all his money buying a butterfly from a postcard dealer at the Palais Royal. The butterfly was blue. A blue butterfly. So blue, a blue which cut me to the heart. A butterfly of absolute color, color with a life of its own. A butterfly from a far-off paradise. A butterfly which lent its wings to painting. <laughs> 